Praise the Lord. Welcome to our Bible class lesson again on tonight. We're grateful for your presence and we're trusting as always that the Lord will give you the fruit of this lesson that we present to you on this afternoon and that it will be a blessing to your spiritual life. The topic of the lesson that we're going to be dealing with on this afternoon is one, uh, of course, I think is of great importance, and that is the future of our church. When I say the future of our church, uh, no doubt the church shall exist in the earth realm as long as God so see fit until that final day of judgment will come. But at the same time, the question that's given to us is not will the church survive, but will we be a part of that surviving church that Jesus will preserve? So in order to make sure that we are part of that, even though one generation may pass off and another generation may come into play, we have to consider in our timing and in the space that God would give us as leaders, as saints of God, that we are properly preparing the next generation. Uh, just like everything in life, rearing up a child from a child to an adult uh, to face life responsibilities, that child is molded and prepared by the parent to meet uh, the things that life would deal out to them based on the experience of that parent. So likewise, it must be in the body of Christ. We cannot just wait until a child of church reach maturity and start placing them in certain positions or leadership authorities at a, what we say an older age, but we have to prepare them, amen, even as children, amen, that when that time will come, that they will be properly prepared to take the church to the next level as God so see fit. So just in a brief setting on the day, I want to deal with the subject matter. How do we prepare the next generation? Amen. How do we prepare the next generation? Now, everyone, as I stated somewhat just a little bit earlier, must play a part in preparing the next generation. And preparation of the next generation do not start just when you get to church. Uh, the Bible tells us as parents uh, to bring up a child that in the way that he should go. Amen. So preparation of our children starts at the hands of the parents. Amen. Uh, the child can flourish. The child can go to higher spiritual uh, heights and depths in the Lord uh, uh, very easily if they are prepared at home based on the principles of God's word, according to the way God said that a child should be raised. So again, the topic of the lesson that we're going to uh, look at here on this afternoon is how do we prepare the next generations? One of the greatest privileges of life is the opportunity to raise children. Along with this privilege comes a great deal of responsibility. Uh, no child should be born in the world without the parents understanding the great responsibility that God has, amen, passed on to them as the parents that they are to bring that child up properly. God has entrusted the proper care of children to parents. Uh, there is no way that a child can be born in the world and not be born here with parents. Regardless, I know some, the mother as a parent sometimes die in death as the child is born. But that mother had to be the parent before that child was born. Of course, there's a father that comes into play in the picture. It is expected that our children will emulate the godly lifestyle of their parents. In other words, that the parents will set that example of how the child is to live. And I know our children pick up things from the world. They pick up things uh, from TV. They pick up things from their friends that they associate with. Uh, uh, they modelize themselves after things that uh, they think to be exciting or things that get their attention. But the, great, the greatest emulation that any child should emulate themselves after should be that of the parent. For this to happen, the parent must bring the child up in the manner that God has ordained for their lives. In this lesson, we will discuss four major necessities that will help us to properly prepare the next generation for their walk with God. Amen. We teach them every day normalities of life. Uh, uh, when, the, when the child starts crawling, the parent starts looking at the child and say, next would be for the child to walk. Uh, when the child starts trying to talk, 
the parents start dealing with the child and helping him with his words. And, and that, that child basically learns after the example of the parent. So if the parent can have a good uh, model life after Christ, it's not going to be hard for the child to, to emulate the life of that parent and follow in their footprints that will better them to be prepared uh, for the next generation, amen, that is to come. So we want to look at, uh, uh, again, uh, four principles in particular uh, that will help us to better prepare our children. The first one we're going to look at is parents are to teach their faith to their children. Parents are to teach their faith to their children. The second one we're going to look at is fathers are expected to play a major role in the lives of their children. And this major role is, is, is more than just providing uh, uh, the necessities that they need to be nourished and taken care of. The third point we want to look at is educate the child, the child with sound doctrine. We are to educate our children with sound doctrine. And the fourth one we'll look at is explain more principles to the child. Do not just take it for granted that a child knows how it is supposed to behave. And that means also that the parent recognizes bad behavior. Uh, the old saying, uh, it's easy to bend a tree when it got sap in it. When it becomes older and, and becomes rigid, it'll break before it bends. So we want to explain more principles to the child. Let's look at the first uh, principle that we will discuss in this lesson, which is parents are to teach their faith to their children. Parents are to teach their faith to their children. We live in a world today that give us a vast opportunity of choice. And that means that in many cases, uh, things that uh, parents of old that have taken hold of and said, this is the direction, this is the way. Uh, children today of the world basically are choosing many different outlets and directions. And in some cases that can be good, in some cases it can be bad. Uh, uh, we, you wanna make sure that when it comes down to bringing up a child up in the way it should go, that you are able to teach that child uh, the faith of the parents. And I understand I'm, I'm not uh, worried about the faith because the Bible tells us there's only one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And that comes down to the truth of God's word. So, so the parent uh, are to actually teach their faith to their children. Amen. Teach them what is right from the word of God. Teach them what God says from his holy word. Do not leave it up to the child to develop in their own conscience and their own thought, whether they accept faith or not. Uh, uh, again, the Bible said, bring them up in the way they should go. When they are old, they will not depart. Somewhere if you put it in them, it's going to find a way to materialize in their life. So parents are to teach their children their faith. Parents are to teach their faith, actually, that they believe in according to the word of God to their children. Listen, if you will. One of the greatest tasks that our children will undertake is that of learning. Our kids will be afforded the opportunities to learn things that will be helpful to a proper spiritual and physical development. Now, you want to teach them your faith because, amen, as you teach them the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's going to help them to properly develop both spiritually and physically. Well, how does the physical part come in? Because it's going to help them avoid some things that they can become entangled in that they'll suffer with or at least try to seek a deliverance from those things that are physical that can ruin their life and also be passed on to their children. Uh, we must also be mindful that we will learn some things that could be damaging uh, to their proper development. Amen. Well, parents got to be mindful that children can learn some things uh, that can be damaging to their proper development. This is why, amen, it is the responsibility of the parent to teach them the faith. Now, when you talk about the faith, you're talking about the truth of God's word. That word is going to direct them away from the things that could damage them, those things that can leave a mark on them or even put them in a position that there are certain things of God that they can be blessed with and through life, even on the natural side, that they are never attained to because they were not properly taught. 
This is why it's critical that parents take an interest in teaching their children their faith. Amen. Because you're protecting them spiritually and you're protecting them physically. When you begin to uh, teach a child, amen, the errors of the ways that the world present to them. And, and basically uh, a child grows up wanting his liberty or her liberty, wanting to be able to make his or her own decisions. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the child must learn how to make decisions. But at the same time, you should not leave a child to himself to make decisions that he has no information about. Uh, uh, a child may be rebellious in choosing to listen to their parents, but at the very least, the parent ought to give them the information of righteousness and what they're dealing with, that as they make their decisions, they will at least be presented with that information of righteousness that comes from God. That as they make their decisions, when things do go wrong, when they don't choose the righteousness of God, at least they'll be able to look back and they'll be able to see the righteousness of God because it does not take a rocket scientist to come to a conclusion that things are not working like I thought they would work. And the only thing that's gonna work properly in life, the only thing that's gonna produce in a satisfying manner are the things that God has ordained that he will accept. Anything else we try to do as human beings, amen, to try to make things fit, to try to make things satisfy, it's not going to work if it's not ordained of God. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter six, and we're gonna look at verses six through verse number eight. Verse six states, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Now, first of all, the parent must have the word of God in his or her heart before they can teach it to the children. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Don't worry about how they respond. Don't worry about how they look. Uh, children are, are, are very, very, very curious about learning. And many times it will look like when you're trying to teach them godly principles, they are, uh, uh, are spelling a whole lot of questions towards them. What is and let me live my own life. Don't pay that no, no attention. Uh, those are stages of growing pains. Uh, it's just like giving a child medicine that does not taste good, but you, the parent, know that that medicine is going to resolve the problem. So you, you got to find a way to get that medicine in the child, regardless of what the child may say or think or feel about the medicine. So it is with the word of God. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. Uh, uh, everyday life everyday examples, everyday experiences can be an opportunity that you apply the word of God to what is actually happening physically in the home and dealing with the child. And when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up, just let life uh, be an opportunity that as a parent, you can actually show a child, amen, the things of God pertaining to what they're experiencing in life. I remember when I, uh, uh, the boys in particular was young coming up and uh, that's the generation of my children that was a exploratory uh, generation. Uh, they had to have some evidence. They explored things for themselves. Uh, so I understood that just information itself was not going to be enough in order to convince them of the righteousness of God. So what I did, I did not abandon the righteousness of God. Uh, uh, I would take them through life examples and show them things of life and then apply the word of God to that so they can look at the things of the world and apply the word of God to it. Uh, uh, for instance, I remember I would take them to the bad part of town sometimes and you would see this man walking down the street, just strung out on drugs, um, talking to himself and, you know, uh, uh, having a great conversation and nobody's there. He's out of his mind. And I would explain to that child, to my children rather, how that man got in the state that he is in. Uh, something has overtaken his mind, something has overtaken his will, something has overtaken his desire, something has overtaken his future. And if you do what this man did to get like he is, you will be just as that man that you're looking at on the street. So, so, so the Bible tells us here again, uh, in verse number seven, thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. Amen. Always, always uh, make sure that you are teaching your children 
as they are children, something about God. Amen. Because they think they, they know a lot because they are researching things. But what the parent will always have that the child will never have in that beginning stage is experience. Uh, sometimes the, the, the parent feels intimidated because the child has a lot of information. But you got to understand something about information. If there is no experience, that information used incorrectly could do you more harm than the process of not knowing anything at all. So I want you to understand God has commanded to the parents uh, that they are to teach their faith to their children. Let's look at uh, number uh, point number two here, and that is fathers are expected to play a major role in the lives of their children. Parents, fathers in particular, are expected to play a major role in the lives of their children. Sometimes as fathers, we feel like if we put a roof over their head, clothes on their back and food on the table, then we've done uh, uh, the greatest part of what we need to do. I'll leave the rest up to mama in the household. And even though the mother plays a great part, uh, uh, a productive family, as God ordained it to be, is a mother and a father. But at the same time, it does not mean that the father is to feel like because he put clothes on their back, roof over their head, and, you know, uh, food on the table, that, that his part is over. No, no, he is to play the role and, and, and I would say the front row of being the spiritual leader in the household, amen, that his children, amen, can see that the father has a love for God, that the father understands the importance of worship, that the father understands the importance, amen, of attending church, amen, and not dragging and not letting it be absent in their lives. So fathers are expected to play a major role in the lives of the children. Fathers are positioned by God to be the spiritual thermostats of their home. By that I mean this, when it comes down to that spiritual realm and that spiritual attitude of the household, uh, fathers are expected to be a part of that. You don't leave that up to the, to, to the uh, wife. Uh, 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 if there's going to be uh, timeliness of attending in this service, uh, the father should be the first one that's dressed. If the household is not getting it together quick enough, the father should be the first one to speak out and say, we're not going to be late. The man so so fathers are positioned by God to be the spiritual thermostats of the home. Now, this makes the mother's job amen, a whole lot easier because she's going to be the one preparing the kids and dressing them and making sure that they have the adequate clothing and whatnot. Uh, uh, it's going to make her job a whole lot easier if the children are already formulated that when it comes time for church worship, or even family worship, that they see the example that the father has set. And it's easier for them, because he's the authoritative one of the household, it's easier for them to, to submit to that authority and submit to those instructions that are laid out and that are actually uh, exemplified by the father in the household. Uh, their proper guidance in the house, in the house sets in motion the proper environment for the child to thrive properly, that is the father. The father's proper guidance in the home literally sets in motion the proper environment for the child to thrive properly. Again, that is whenever that child sees the head of the house, the father, amen, in place where he should be, amen, setting that example of the importance of worship, the importance of God, the importance of church, amen, the importance of prayer, the importance of living a right life, amen, in the eyesight of their children, then that child will have an easier, a easier time adopting a man to that format and that example that is set by the father. So fathers are expected to play a major role in the lives of their children. Let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter six and verse number four. And ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath. Now, now uh, uh, in Ephesians, it gives us a man uh, dealing with a father. And because he is the head, he is the authoritative one, that fathers are not to provoke your children to wrath. You've got to deal with them in such a way that the child does not become rebellious. Amen. And, and authority, sometimes people don't understand this, but the authority of the father many times will drive rebellion out of the household. A father that does not utilize proper godly authority leaves an open where rebellion can come in the life of the child. 
And this is where now you see children telling their parents what they're going to do and they're not going to do and telling their parents what they ought to do, what they ought not to do. Uh, that's the wrong example. And many times, as you may see that take place in a, in a household, that means that the devil has planted a spirit of rebellion in there. So, so again, here in Ephesians 6 and 4, amen, the word of God tells us, and you fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but listen, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Amen. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. God has given, amen, a particular care, a particular demeanor in which children are to be raised, amen, after the will and purpose of God. The Bible tells us children are inherited to the Lord, but God has entrusted, amen, their upbringing and their rearing to the parents and to the father here in particular, amen. He has commanded, amen, through scripture, amen, that he might bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Don't leave it to the child's mind to decide how he or she is going to be raised. Don't leave it to society to dictate in your home <laughs> how the child is to be raised. Now, I'm talking about the father being in place in the household. Uh, uh, God has given a man that household through the leadership of that father, the direct responsibility of bringing those children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Let's look at the third point here uh, that we want to look at when we consider how do we prepare the next generation. Uh, we, we prepare the next generation by educating the children with sound doctrine. There is so much out there to believe today. And many, many children's persuasion and their beliefs are based on the mass of what's happening around them. Like, for instance, this generation of the day uh, do not see much or anything wrong with homosexuality or shacking up. They don't see anything wrong with that. And one of the reasons that this generation do not see much wrong with that is because many of them of their, their days to generation was raised in that. In other words, that was the primary happening in their coming up. Uh, the generation of the day, amen, uh, come up, amen, experiencing that homosexuality, amen, is accepted. They came up experiencing uh, that, that, that you can live together but not have to worry about marrying each other as the Bible commanded that it ought to be. So, so now you've got to educate the child, amen, help them understand that everything that happens in the earth realm, even though the majority may not say is wrong, you have to be able to educate them what God said about the matter, because right and wrong is not in the eyes of the beholder. Right and wrong is determined by what God says is wrong and what God says is right. So we have to educate the, uh, the children with sound doctrine. Listen to uh, this statistic, if you will. As early as five years old, some children are able to start forming thoughts about religion. Uh, now, you were here uh, many times uh, uh, in some cases, ch children, even younger than that, begin to talk about the Lord, even if they uh, mostly if they are children, they've been raised in church. In other words, their parents are saved and they spend a lot of time in church. Then that child come up emulating the things of church. But but what I want you to see is early as five years old, some children are able to start forming thoughts about religion. In other words, they are able to start developing some sense of seriousness about religion, about God, about church, about worship. So listen, if you will, at this age, the child tends to believe what he or she is taught. So this is a perfect timing now, amen, especially as the child show interest, amen, in religion, shows interest in church, that the parent, amen, become aware of that and understand that now is the perfect time to begin to teach this child and educate this child with sound doctrine. Listen, if you will, many times children will respond with the statement, my daddy or my mama said. And, and that means that that whatever you say at that age in particular, they believe it. So 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 use that authority of their belief in you to educate them with sound doctrine. Amen. Don't don't let that opportunity pass. Uh, uh, don't don't think that a child uh, uh, can comprehend a video game or a child can, can manipulate his way around uh, the website 
and, and get to what he wants to see there, but yet he cannot begin to respond to religion at that age. Uh, our children are very, very knowledgeable and keen if you give them an electronic device. Uh, uh, they, they will look at you, handle that device, and you're not saying anything to them, and they'll start grabbing for that phone or they'll start grabbing for the iPad because what they see, they have taken it in and they can do the same things you can do. I can remember the first times uh, 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 my grandkids at a very, very early age, uh, we started FaceTiming and whatnot. And uh, uh, especially my granddaughter uh, uh, who have her uh, grandmother's phone all the time. And my, my wife would FaceTime and she grabbed the phone unknowingly, not grab, but my wife let her have it. And she went there and started FaceTime. She knew what to do to FaceTime. So if they have that kind of intellect without anyone speaking to them, showing that they can comprehend just by seeing, how much more can that child comprehend by the parent feeding them and educating them with sound doctrine? So do not think that you're overloading a child at an early age by teaching them, amen, the word of God. I remember our kids, our boys in particular, as they were young coming up and we had them reciting uh, biblical verses at a very, very early age. And they were able to comprehend that. Uh, we noticed um, very early uh, back then we just used to record all the, I used to record in church a lot and they would get home. And back then they didn't watch it on TV, not at our command, but they wanted to put those videos in and they wanted to listen to those messages of the day last week, last year, especially when we went out of town to a service and I recorded and you can hear them in their room emulating the preachers or the persons that were singing those songs. And if you did not know who was in the room, you would have thought that individual was actually in the room that was actually responding on those tapes. They can even emulate down to their voices. So children have a great capability of learning and, 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 and taking in at a very, very young age. So let's not forego the opportunity as parents to put it in that child at a very, very young age. Because of their tender faith, it is important that we educate them with sound doctrine. Amen. They, they, their faith is tender at that time. And if we don't take the opportunity as parents to put it into them at a very young age, there will be a system or mechanism that will feed down into them. And you don't want someone else being responsible for feeding your children spiritually that might feed them the wrong thing. Let's look at Titus, if you will, chapter two and verse number one. Titus chapter two and verse number one, if you will. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. I love this. Speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. If you want to let them hear anything, they're going to hear a lot of things. But make sure you hear they, you allow them through your speaking to them to hear things that are sound doctrine. There's there's something about getting something down inside of you. And I will relate it to food. Uh, some foods that you put in your body, uh, it passed through your system very quickly. And even though it passed through your system very quickly, it does what it's supposed to do. It provides nutrition for the body. Amen. So you can have the physical and mental strength and strength and alertness uh, to continue on in your doings of the day. Now, one of the foods that stays in your system longer than other foods is meat. And, and I said it like that to say this. Uh, um, uh, you may be putting lightweight food into your children or you may be putting meat in your in, in the lives of your children as you speak to them. But make sure you feed them with the spiritual nurture that they need, that whenever junk food, uh, that's things of the world is fed to them, they will have instilled in them enough of God, enough of righteousness, enough of the doctrine, enough of the word of God that they can recognize what is actually benefiting them and then come to recognize actually what is harming them. Uh, the next principle we want to look at when it comes down to preparing the next generation, which I think is, is, is very more so important in this day and time than it ever was before, because we have lived over the years in a generation that has come to the point that it has no more moral values. 
what used to be decent and what used to be undecent is very questionable in the eyes of the generation today. Uh, uh, God demands that we have a moral value about ourselves. In other words, there's just some things that when it comes down to uh, moral principles that we should not go uh, 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 to this length or that length. Uh, when it comes down to what God says clean, when it comes down to what God says unclean, our children has to understand that. You know, uh, the world today, uh, when it comes to sexuality, uh, has no boundaries. When it comes to same sex, no boundaries. When it comes down to uh, covering your body, when it comes down to uh, some of the words that will come out your mouth, uh, uh, they have no boundaries. So, so, so you got to explain to your children. You got to sit them down and make sure they understand the value of moral principles. You know, uh, uh, even though all around you, this is happening, this to the child, this is happening in your presence, but you should not indulge in these things. You should not allow uh, yourself to go to uh, this length or direction that you see the mass is going to. So again, uh, uh, explain to our children uh, uh, the moral principles that's outlined in the word of God. Moral corruption has expanded its boundaries with each new generation. In other words, when it comes down to moral values, every generation gets worse. Uh, 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 when you look at, uh, the, 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 uh, especially when you look at uh, the television today, uh, basically anything that they are trying to sell to you on TV has some type of sexuality attached to it. Now, now what does uh, going half naked has to do with trying to sell you a hamburger? Uh, um, what does uh, picking out a motel that you're going to stay at on vacation has to do uh, uh, with sexuality? But everything has some sense of degeneration in it. When it comes to trying to attack, attach rather, or, or motivate your attention towards purchasing something that the world is offering to you. So more corruption has expanded its boundary with each new generation. We live in a world that is governed by personal fulfillments versus God's ordained purpose. People, even in the church world today, are motivated not by God's principles, not by God's will or God's purpose, they are motivated by what's in it for me. What am I going to get out of it? In other words, it's a world of self-fulfillment. It's a world that indulges in first self-satisfaction. And, and now, 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 when it comes down to the things of God and what God has said through his word when, concerning your brother, your sisters is doing to others as you would have them do unto you. That principle in the world I live in today uh, which used to be valued 20, 30 years ago, it's hard to find those principles, amen, being valued in the, even in the church world today. Children cannot teach themselves moral values. Uh, it's virtually impossible for a child to self-teach itself moral values. Uh, by the time a child goes through uh, life and experience some things that really damage them and really uh, hinders them for the rest of their life, and they learn that they should not have indulged in that, by the time they get that knowledge, it's too late. It, it has already damaged their life, and some, some will never pull out of it. Some will never get their head above the water that they can live a productive life because the moral value of life has been robbed away from them. They was never taught it. Uh, everybody around them was sexually active. Uh, everybody around them was doing drugs. Everybody around them was stealing. Everybody around them was using profanity. So children cannot teach themselves moral values, nor should they be allowed to develop their own moral values. No parent should allow a child to develop their own moral values. You got to tell a child what's right. You got to tell a child what's wrong. Amen. And what is determined to be right or wrong is based on what God said is right, what God said is wrong. They must be taught the character more value that is supported and objected by the word of God. Amen. God do support uh, certain things, then there are certain things that God object. You got to teach them what God accepts 
And then you have to teach them what God objects. That you just can't do something because you can do it. And yes, God will not tie our hands behind our back. No, God will not glue our lips together. No, God will not seal our eyes together. But yet he give us the commandment of his word that we understand what he, he would tolerate, what he set and what he rejects. So I pray today in this lesson you have heard something that will bless your life, because if we expect the generation of tomorrow to be productive, then we must teach them the principles of the word of God. And those principles of the word of God have not and never will change. And I know many times we try to accommodate and reach our children, the Z and the X generation and all these. And that's fine and well. And whatever we, they, we may name them to be, our children today learn a whole lot different than what we learn. But note this, note this, out of all the changes of the generations, the word of God was formulated by God that it will meet the needs of every generation. Sometimes we are trying to, if we are not careful, we're trying to compromise with the generation of the day to get their attention. Well, let me say it like this. The greatest attention of any unsaved person is Christ Jesus himself. If a person is not attracted to Christ, you may bring them in by masses. But once you bring them in, you'll find that you don't have anything to hold them. You want to make sure that the children, the generations that we're dealing with today are attracted to Christ. In other words, they see him as the savior. They see him as the deliverer. They see him as the way maker. They see him as the standard bearer. Anything else we may attempt to do, amen, and substitute Christ is not going to bring that generation of the day to the place where when their life, amen, comes to that state of judgment, that they must give an account where they can actually hear the Lord say, well done. So I pray today that this will help us in some small sense. Amen. Understand the part that we play as adults. Amen. As leaders. Amen. Of the church world as parents. Amen. How God has ordained that we are to properly prepare uh, the next generation. Uh, children have a tendency as they begin to think for themselves and they think a whole lot quicker than they did when I came up. But that generation that think for themselves has a tendency to offer a lot of questions. Uh, but the key to their questions is this, is you put down in them what thus saith the Lord. They may reject it. They may not accept it. But one thing they will do is they will have what they need. And once they come to that conclusion that what they was going after was not what they was needed, then they look back at what the parent put in them. They look back at how the parent lived. They look back at the position of the parent today. And listen, uh, there's no vast uh, 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 difference when it comes down to uh, the generation of yesterday and the generation of the day. They're still human. They just utilize different methods based on what society has offered to them. But the plan of salvation has not changed. The standard of God's word has not changed. The morality of the scriptures, amen, has not changed. So give them Christ. Give them the word of God, regardless of what's happening around them, regardless of how they may even seem to reject it. Uh, one thing about medicine, it does not really matter how it tastes to you. If it gets down in you, regardless of how bad it tastes, it will do and has the power to deliver the illness of that body. And the word of God is, is even greater than that. Uh, no matter how they may reject it, no matter how they may see it, if they can get that word down in them, like Jeremiah, it became the rejoicing of my soul. So I pray today that the lesson of the hour has been a blessing to each of us. I pray that you've heard something today. Amen. That will motivate you to hold fast to God's unchanging hand. And even as we consider the positions of our future generation, which is the generation of the day. Amen. That we hold fast to the principles and the doctrine. Amen. That has been taught. Amen. Ever since the initiation of Christ church. God bless you. May his favor and grace rest upon you. He allows all to meet again. You be blessed now.